Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. My name is John Nine. Uh, I'm a senior programmer here at the festival, and I want to welcome you to uh, this Power of Story panel, to our off-screen series, and to the 2019 Sundance Film Festival. Um, the name of our conversation, Power of Story, Pushing Boundaries. Uh, I want to thank um, Dropbox. This program, Power of Story series, is presented by Dropbox. Greatly appreciate their support, not only of the series, but of the idea of dialogue here at the festival. Um, the off-screen program is really pretty huge. There are conversations happening all the time. I encourage you to take a look at them. We like to think of it as great films on screen and great dialogue off screen. So tomorrow, not tomorrow, yes, tomorrow morning in the Cinema Cafe, Jane Campion and Tessa Thompson in conversation. We have a panel tomorrow afternoon on faith in film. Uh, Cinema Cafe on Saturday, Nisha Ganatra, the director of Late Night with Desiree Akhavan. Please check out the program and come out see more of the dialogue. This afternoon's conversation, Pushing Boundaries, um, that can mean a lot of things in film. Uh, certainly, people talk about it in terms of formal choices and boundaries, in terms of subject matter, but we are sort of approaching it in a different way here and, and talking about kind of the conceptual approach that artists and filmmakers have uh, towards the comfort zone of audiences, towards personal social sensibilities, and the idea of engaging with audiences in a, in a different way relating to that. The artists here, we're grateful that we've assembled, I think, a really great group. Um, I'm just gonna identify them. You have their bios here, but so that you know who's speaking. Um, next to me, closest to me, Asad J. Malik. He is uh, the artist of A Jester's Tale in our VR section. Rick Alverson is the director of The Mountain in our spotlight section. Mats Brueger uh, is the director of Cold Case Hammerschult, which is in the international documentary competition. Penny Lane, uh, the director of Hail Satan in our US documentary competition. And uh, leading this band is uh, John Horn, who has been an arts and culture journalist for many years. He's the host of a fantastic show, which if you don't listen to on the radio in LA, you can listen to as a podcast, uh, KPP, KPCC's The Frame. I do want to mention briefly, we, we were meant to have Kitty Green. We lost her. Well, we didn't lose her. We know where she is. She's in New York. <laughs> She's in New York. Um, her, uh, she uh, is making a film about uh, a day of the life of uh, Harvey Weinstein's assistants that uh, sort of just went into very immediate mode, and she wasn't wow. able to be here with us. But I do thank everybody who is here, and thank you all for coming. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you all for coming out. We have four filmmakers up here, and we're going to be talking about their works. And I just wanted to see, before we get going, show of hands, how many people have seen at least one of the projects that these filmmakers have worked on? Oh, that's really good. Okay. Keep your hands up. How many people have seen two? Three? Is anybody here seen all four? Was there one other? Okay, so I, I win, I've seen all four. Um, but thank you for showing up and thank you for checking uh, their stories out and I think you can see them um, in the remaining days if you want to. So before we talk about your projects, I wanna talk about something that happened on Thursday. There was an opening night dinner for patrons of the Sundance Institute and Boots Riley, who uh, was here uh, last year, was sorry to bother you, was talking about when he started working on his movie. He wanted to be a filmmaker and he wanted to write a screenplay. So he said he bought a book, the actual title of which is How to Write a Movie in 21 Days, The Inner Movie Method. <laughs> and he started reading this book and the book said, this has to happen at this point. This has to happen at this point. This character needs to realize this at this point. It was basically a you know unalterable bible of how a story had to unfold mm -hmm. none of you obviously followed that method but i'm wondering at what point were you told there was one way to tell a story and what was the moment or the start of the process where you realized there was a different way and you didn't need to follow the model that everybody else had prescribed so penny i'm going to ask you what was your moment of awakening that there were different ways to tell stories as opposed to the way that stories were taught that had to be told? Right. <clears throat> I think actually uh, I might have gone in the other direction. <laughs> like, I kind of found out there was a way you're supposed to tell stories like way after I started making films and was very surprised to discover that there were these 
rules that everyone followed, like three act structure. But to be fair, like when I look back, even at the work I made before, I knew that. I was kind of doing a lot of that stuff uh, without really knowing it. Like I think there actually are intuitive sort of forms that we know as humans and the culture that we're in, where uh, that they're all kind of deeply in us. So I found out later that there was a way to do it, but I think I was sort of doing it already. That's probably good. I don't know, maybe. That's what about you? <clears throat> well, um, both my parents are journalists, uh, and um, and. Excel in or excelled in traditional hardcore journalism, and um, maybe my way of going about things is a way of uh, like an awkward teenage rebellion <laughs> in a way. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I you know, and, and furthermore, I was never. I applied to to the Danish school of journalism, but was not accepted. Which was great, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so I began studying uh, movie and media science instead, during which I was watching a lot of films which I would never have seen, like German expressionist films from from the 30s, and which gave me a whole other take on storytelling. Rick, what about you? Uh, I mean, I kind of grew up on television and Spielberg and this sort of thing. I remember going to. Uh, Indiana Jones and I and, and being irrevocably altered for several days because I felt like my face was Harrison Ford's <laughs> face and I had the distinct impression that I was walking around and I like I had his face and it, and it really unsettled me <laughs> I think years later when I uh, you know I was uh, I think 16 when I saw Stalker at the film forum by Tarkovsky and I realized oh well this this is this powerful medium can do something much different that's not just intoxicating and sort of left to the whim of whatever may happen, you know? Um, so, yeah. I said, what about you? So you're saying there are rules? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, There's there like a, a whole rules. section in the bookstore. No one <laughs> told me this new information. Um, <laughs> so because I work with augmented reality, it's uh, it's an interesting question whether you take the rules that film has established over the last 100 years or you don't, and you try to start with kind of a new idea. Um, and as we were talking backstage for a moment, like, I don't really have any history or training as a film director necessarily, and I think that's an advantage in this case. Rick, I want to read something that you said not that long ago about how you see storytelling in cinema and I think what it suggested is that a lot of what you do, and I suspect other panelists are doing, is in reaction to what you're seeing other people doing. And here's what you said. Passive viewing is something that's happening in, that's, passive viewing is something that's happened in cinema over the years, but I think it's been exacerbated by our habits and social media, as well as our increased ability to control our experiences through digital platforms. That you think that there is a prescribed way of viewing content, not just creating it, and I'm wondering, for all of you, if part of your filmmaking and your augmented reality is in reaction to the way that people expect stories to be told, and you're giving them an alternative mm -hmm. to that reality. Mm -hmm. I would say, I mean, for me, like, what I want out of art is to be disturbed. Like, I want to be confused and sort of taken out of reality and, like, messed with and then kind of dropped back in and you sort of figure out what to do next. So I don't really think of cinema as being special. I just think it's, like, one of the many things we do as people to communicate with one another. And I want the same thing out of a movie as I want out of like a painting or a book or a conversation with someone smart. Like I want to be educated and upset and disturbed and, uh, you know, and thrown off balance. And so I think that's what I'm trying to do, you know? Which I don't think is what most people are trying to do, as far as I can tell, I don't know. Matt, what about you? Well, um, for me, I, I saw this, um, it's a really good film, by the way, um, Racing Hill. Uh, it's a movie about Molly. Molly Evans. Yes, uh, this Texan column columnist and journalist. Mm -hmm. Like a, she was like a female Hunter S. Thompson or something. Mm -hmm. um, but she said that there's the, the only thing in the middle of the road is yellow stripes and dead armadillos, which is <laughs> it's, it's a nice quote. <laughs> a, a, and there's truth in that, you know. So um, if you are, uh, you know, lucky enough to to have a film financed. I, th I think it's you should you know, do your very best to make it as unique as possible uh, to um, 
to w remove it as much as possible from the middle of the road. So there's only one kind of that film. Because that will, in the end, attract the audience to you. Mm. Rick, what about you? I guess I'm asking you to react to your own thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that we're very much conditioned in the way that we, we, we imbibe media, narrative, or, you know, across the board. And uh, we're very much conditioned not to be aware that we're conditioned. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the thing operates economically, politically. You're like, it's in everybody's interest, all of the content creators, that you are easily manipulated. And whether that means being drawn into a, a particular emotional state that you can easily get out of at the end of 90 minutes uh, so that you tell your friends, wow, I just had this great experience. And, uh, you know, or you're, you're, you know, uh, you're susceptible to messaging, you know, uh, consumer messaging, political messaging. I mean, this, is, this has been going on a long time, but now it's obviously, um, you know, I think this discussion about narrative and about uh, ignorance of the formal elements of uh, any of these, these, these mediums, you know, uh, is uh, particularly relevant because we are, uh, we're, we're aware now in a political grand scale of how we've been manipulated. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I think that that's been going on a long time. I think it's been going on through narrative, you know, through literature and theater, but particularly in the hundred years of, of you know, Hollywood's sort of, uh, you know, export and grip on, 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 on the business. And I said, what about you when you're thinking yeah. about the way that your augmented reality um, show piece is being received, how much are you thinking about, even unconsciously, about audience expectations about what they're going to see and the way this story is going to go? So, I mean, a lot of it is about breaking those expectations because I think what AR and VR present is a whole new opportunity, right? Like to tell stories, I think these mediums are inherently a lot more visceral. Um, I think you can be a lot more abstracted. The storyline doesn't have to be as linear. Everything doesn't need to be so explained. So a lot of what I was thinking with this piece in particular was like, how can you transcend the actual form of the piece itself? So one of my goals with this was, how can I get these characters and people's dreams? How can people dream about this? And a good way to do it, the, the two rules I established for myself was number one, the AR piece will unfold in your bedroom. So the characters will sit on your bed, right? And I saw with my previous piece that once you see these characters actually in space and you know, in three dimensions, and they have a certain presence, and that presence is there even when you're not actually doing the experience. When you turn it off, they have a certain ghostly presence left behind because you associate the characters with your space very deeply. And the other element was that the story should not resolve. They shouldn't, they shouldn't feel like it all ended or it came to end. We, we didn't even play a, play a credit sequence at the end. So then they leave with the story still in their minds, and hopefully that's the way to get into their dreams. <laughs> mm -hmm. Before we take a look at some of your work, I think that idea has been critical in this year's festival. There have been a lot of films, narrative and documentary, that are asking questions, looking for truth, but a lot of the films don't seem to be comfortable answering all those questions. I can think of, like, especially, I think, your film, I think Mountains, I think certainly Hail Satan, and certainly at the end of your film, at the end of your story, the audience is left with this idea of, like, are, were my assumptions right? What is actually going to happen next? Is this a happy ending? Is this a sad ending? And I think audiences are so conditioned to be told this is everything ties together in a certain way. And I'd say all of you are working against that. We're not going to wrap everything up. Yeah. We're not going to tell you that everything is oh fine and that all questions are yeah, answered. Nothing makes me more insane than people who watch like a 70 to 90 minute documentary and think they know everything about something. <laughs> like that is such a mis, that's like a very bad idea. It's like evil. You know, like that's, that's like, if you leave your audience feeling like they don't need to know anything else about that topic, you've done like such a disservice. Because if you've made a film, you know how limited it is. There's so little you can do and in the, like one movie. I mean, it's like nothing. It's like a third of a New Yorker article. Like it's like there's just nothing in there. Like, you know, so if you've made a film, you should know more than anyone how, how much you left out. You know, that makes me nuts. That idea in virtual reality is even more extreme. Like. Uh, for example, virtual reality over the last five years has, has been kind of tied, touted around as the empathy machine. The empathy machine. And half the time the pieces are basically, you put it on and for five minutes you're, you're in a 360 video of a Syrian refugee camp and you come out with this really kind of uh, delusional sense of moral superiority that now you know what it feels to be in their shoes. 
Yeah. I mean, I think that happens, that's been happening a long time in narrative film too, and it's a real problem. <laughs> I mean, for people to feel as though, that, you know, I'm even worried about, I wasn't a fan of Django Unchained because uh, I, I, it was this, this sort of exercise. I mean, we're very vulnerable when we're in the, in the cinema space. We don't believe that we are. We believe, oh, I know it's not real, but our bodies don't know that, mm. you know, and our emotions. And you know, I mean, it's like, you know, it's essentially functioning in a rudimentary way as in the dream space. And you're, mm -hmm. you are, you do open up yourself and become vulnerable. And then you're very susceptible to the experience. And, but what does it do to you, you know? I mean, in, in uh, uh, you know, in Django, when it, it was a, a great catharsis for a lot of people who have been divorced from their histories. Um, and I just, you know, I was concerned that what, what, what was the, you know, what are the ramifications of that catharsis when you step back out into the world and it hasn't been had right. and it isn't available. If it's solved in, in the, in the two dimensional box of the, of the, 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 the film world, that can be dangerous, mm -hmm. you know? Let's talk about each of your projects. Uh, Penny, let's look at a little bit from Hail Satan and then we'll talk about the making of the film. You want me to act it out? No, it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta be patient. <laughs> it's not my strong suit. Hi, uh, I was wondering who I speak to regarding an upcoming local news event. Oh, okay, great. Uh, I'm calling from Big News Publicity, and there's a rally that's taking place tomorrow at the state capitol uh, by the Satanic Temple. The Satanic Temple. S, -S as in Sam. Great, thank you. And there you have it, and that was an ABC affiliate. spread a message of goodwill and benevolence and uh, open-mindedness and free expression. What is your name? That's not important. It's a beautiful day here at the state capitol. Great day to be a Satanist. Great day to be a human being. <clears throat> we honor Governor Rick Scott. Hail Satan, Rick, for providing us this opportunity to make the satanic cause clear and make our presence known. And uh, I believe it and I'm very excited about it. A satanic temple fully supports Florida Governor Rick Scott, who has been pushing for prayer in public schools. Jesus Christ uh, became my savior at a very young age. Uh, That's right, I, uh, Satanists pushing for prayer and backing a Tea Party favorite. We spoke to one of the Satanists today about why they support the law. Lucian Graves, and yes, that is the name the gentleman gave us, told us that the law would lead to, quote, a boom in religious diversity. Basically, the argument being, you open the door to God, you open the door to Satan. We're not what you think we are, and we're, we're, here, to, we're here to help people understand that about us and also about themselves. What do you think of Rick Scott? I think he's a great American. You don't really believe that. I do. And, uh... Hope? No. Hail Satan! Hail Satan!
Um, Penny, before we before I ask about the film, I want to ask about the punctuation yeah. in the title. It is a question mark, not an exclamation point, <laughs> but that's very important. Yeah. Explain the question mark, then we'll talk about the movie. The question mark is really like an invitation. Um, you know, most people, I, this film is aimed at like a mainstream audience, and most people in the mainstream audience are not comfortable like saying the term Hail Satan as a kind of declarative statement. So we thought of the question mark as being kind of like an invitation to people who like, maybe aren't so sure they want to hail Satan quite yet. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to ask you about the story you're telling, because this is a group of people who, you know, yes, Satanism is their religion, mm -hmm. they, but they're really after something bigger than Satan. Mm -hmm. um, they're after religious tolerance. And basically, they're going around the country saying, if the government is going to erect a monument to Christianity or convene a meeting with a Christian prayer, mm -hmm. Under the Constitution, they must allow other faiths and other religions to participate. So they're really cha challenging the whole idea of free speech and free religion and the question of whether or not the government can actually pick and choose a religion, which of course it can't. So was that the movie that you thought you were making when you set out to tell the story? And how did this group of people allow you to tell the story in a new way? Right. Yeah, so the story is really the story of how this insanely silly kind of media stunt that you guys all just saw actually in the course of just a few years evolves into a genuine international, spiritual, religious, political movement with hundreds of thousands of followers. Uh, so I thought that was a pretty interesting story. And in certain ways, I thought, you know, not so different from the origin story of any religion. Mm -hmm. um, every religion begins with sort of some kind of, let's say, bizarre, strange, sort of weird PR stunty kind of, you know, um, miracles and whatnot. And then, you know, we eventually we come to take that as like a sort of normal religious faith. So the only reason this looks weird to us now is that we're living through it and we're seeing it happen. But yeah, so this was kind of, that, that part of it, I think, was always the story I wanted to tell. What I wasn't really expecting was to come to understand how, just how sincere, sincere, the Satanists that I was meeting were in their religious identification with this movement. I, I mean, on some level, you see something like this, it's the headlines, and you think, well, they're just joking, like they're just kidding around. And they are kidding around because, like, Satanism is a wicked, fun religion, and, like, joking is part of it, and trolling is part of it, and that's all true. But they really, truly, like, are a religion, and I think that's extremely difficult for people to understand. And so that's really what the film became about. Is, helping people to sort of like undermine their own preconception about what a Satanist is. And obviously the people are doing that not only to the people that they're encountering, but ultimately they're gonna do it with the audience who watches this film. Yeah, that's really the idea. I mean, the journey of the film is what happens with the person watching it. Um, you know, the film does, asks people to do a lot of intellectual work and I hope it's fun. And I think that laughing is a good way to kind of get a little more open to changing your mind about things. Okay, Mats, let's talk about uh, Cold Case Hammerskjöld, a documentary that's playing at the festival. I think you brought some, uh, a scene from it. Let's take a look at yes. what you've got. Does it need any setup, or should we just start with it? No, I, I don't think so. Okay, so, yeah. let's take a look. It's a bit like in films when people have to dig their own grave. I just need a time out, John. Huh? I'm about to be throwing up. Oh, Jesus. <sighs> Can I give a hand? You're on, did, did you have the, uh, the gel? Yes. Because I'm having uh, blisters? Yeah. I mean, if they are broken, you know, it may be good to clean them. It hurts a lot. It hurts a lot. Amazingly, we are given permission to start digging inside the airport, but then suddenly someone calls from Lusaka and tells the airport to stop this. They don't want us to be digging for the wreckage. Okay. Um, so, you know, also close, but no cigar. <laughs> permission has to come from somewhere else. I, you know, my principle is that it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. 
No, no, no. No, no. Okay. No, in the, in the airport, no. In the airport, it's better to ask for permission than forgiveness. Isn't that a bit too early? It's never too early for cigars, Johan. You're shaking. Yeah. It all the all the uh, activities with looking for the wreckage has really uh, gone to my nerves. I thought you were a cool man. No, but you know, you know you, the feeling you have where you are really close to something, but mm. then, you then you are further away than ever before. Um, <laughs> I'm going to give a little context here. You are at the site where the plane that was yes. carrying Dodge Harmer Gold in 1961 crashed. There are yes. a lot of people who believe that he was murdered because he was working to rid Africa of imperialist and uh, colonist powers. And you are, with two shovels and a little uh, metal detector, trying to dig up the wreckage of his plane yes. uh, outside the airport where it crashed. Actually, actually inside the airport. Inside the airport. <laughs> Which is but the wreckage weird. is buried there, yes. and you have two shovels. Yes. And you're wearing the pith helmet for a specific reason. To protect our Scandinavian skin. Okay. <laughs> but part of this story, and you saw a very quick glimpse of it, is that you are telling two secretaries, you only see one of them at this point, yeah. what is happening in the film. You're almost dictating your movie in real time. And you admit in the film that you do this because you don't think the film is quite coming together. But I want to talk to you about how you assemble this film. Is that always its design, or do you look at what you have and, not, and start imposing that kind of narrative structure on the facts that you've gathered? Well, I, I knew quite early on that there would be a lot of narration in the film. If people were able to understand anything about, it's a very complex um, you know, case, the Hammerschild crash. So there would have to be a lot of narration. So, so I was looking for a device, a contraption, which could make that you know, come along effectively and nicely. And which led me to the idea with the secretaries, them and I working on the narration together and also using their voices, them reading the text. But then I also told them, you know, please ask me questions, uh, whatever you feel like about what, what I tell you. And then they were, they were asking, Brilliant questions, like at one point, Sapphire, the Congolese secre uh, secretary, suddenly asks if, if this is a, she says, is what, she asks, is this a fiction film? Um, which, you know, I'm, I'm having doubts myself at that <laughs> point in time. Uh, and um, so, and, and also at, at in the beginning, I thought the main villain of the story, uh, a, um, a, a South African man named Keith Maxwell, that he was like a buffoon, uh, a tinfoil hat sitting in his basement making uh, clip art documents. So I thought that it would be okay for me to, to goof around as well. But later on, I discovered that he was very much for real, that he is probably one of the most scary human beings that have ever w walked this planet. Um, which made me realize that at w one, one point in the film, I, I had to like change the film into basically a, a horror film in a way. There are documentaries at Sundance, I'm thinking of American Factory, where you never hear the filmmakers ask a single question. They're invisible. There are documentaries like Alex Gibney's film, The Inventor, where you, you hear Alex ask a question off camera. And then there are films like yours where you are as much a part of the story as the people that you're talking to. Why is that important to you and how does that change the experience of the story itself and the way that the audience receives it? 
Well, I, I, I like you know, yeah, I like the on honesty of of sh showing yourself as the storyteller um, instead of, of hiding behind the camera. Um, first of all, second of all, um, I, there is a performative side to me. I, I like you know t t taking part in it m myself, and, and that is something I began doing very. Early on, I was uh, doing. A f f uh, I was writing feature stories in, in Denmark. I wrote a feature story where I infiltrated a a clown convention, uh, going undercover as a clown. I thought it would be funny because then you are undercover, undercover. <laughs> um, and that evolved into something really extreme because when we, it's in a small hamlet in Denmark called Svendborg, and clowns from all over the world go, go to this small hamlet. And the leader of the clown festival, um, a guy named uh, Clown Jojo, he told me and my friend, my friend was posing as a Mexican clown and I was posing as a Dutch clown. It doesn't really make any <laughs> sense, but, <laughs> but he teamed us up with, a, um, with a, a group of professional hospital clowns. And we had never done any clowning before. So the next morning we went to the uh, local hospital and when we were at the gates, I realized that we will be clowning inside the psychiatric ward. <laughs> and being a fake clown in front of crazy persons <laughs> is really ethically problematic, I think. <laughs> but but, but there we were at, at, a, at a point of no return. <laughs> and um, and um, But I really like to, you know, experience moments like this and, uh, and really actively take part in it myself. Rick, you did not bring footage from the mountain, correct? No, I have nothing for you. It's okay. Sure. But I'm going to read, uh, I'm going to pick out some adjectives from a very positive review of your film, which I think really explains how people More think about your movie making. This is just some random adjective after uh, challenging, singular, enigmatic, lyrical, and acquired taste. <laughs> mm -hmm. The alienated mindset of, the, of an American dream set adrift his metaphorical universe, and tableau-like images. And I think that is a very apt and fitting description of, of how you tell stories. And if people haven't seen The Mountain, how would you describe what it's about and what it's based on and about who Dr. Walter Freeman was? Um, uh, well, uh, the movie is loosely, I mean, it's, it's loosely based on uh, the decline of Dr. Walter Freeman. Uh, uh, it's a fictionalized version of him. He invented and popularized the lobotomy in the uh, the mid uh, 20th century, and uh, um, so we sort of use that as architecture to explore some uh, a lot of things, namely uh, the, the our sort of romance with the with with the past and with representations of the past and with cinematic representations. And uh, you know, cinema is always even when it has uh, it, it, it out of America even when they're sort of uh, uh, critical or, uh, you know, progressive views of, of mid-century life and, and uh, the beneficiaries of that, as we know, which were primarily white men, uh, uh, those, there's still like a, a, a formal romance with the thing. There's still like a beauty and, uh, you know, that I, I wanted to work against. And uh, I mean, we lifted the blacks to a certain level. Uh, it's, it's in four, three aspect ratio. They did a bunch of things to make it sort of cumbersome to get in there, to, to easily just be sort of transported to this time. We tried to flatten out the image, you know, uh, because, I mean, in keeping with some of these, these things, I mean, it, well, there's a bunch of, bunch of male figures in the, in the film, all of, all of whom live in a sort of fantastical personal narrative, um, including the, the, the doctor. And there's, a, there's a, a, a young man who's sort of coming of age, pinging off of these representations of, of maleness and... Uh, having a very sort of hard time, uh, uh, you know, contending in the, in, uh, you know, with, with those, those examples. Um, but uh, When you are meeting with your department heads, other filmmakers would cite other films that maybe are similar stories. It strikes me that you would almost reference artwork, paintings, because there's a, there's a style of filmmaking that is very specific to the way that you shoot. When you are having conversations with your sound department, with your actors, with your editors, what are the things that are important to you to focus on? And do you talk about the things 
that you don't want to do or the things that you want to embrace? How do you go about having a conversation that everybody's on the same page? Uh, usually it's, we, we look at everything we don't, don't want to or we want to move away from. I mean, I, ever since I started, you know, the only reason I keep returning to making movies is because it seems like there's a, a you know, a, a, a little corner of counterweight that I can provide. There's some sort of un, un, unpopulated portion of the room and that's, that's not typically popular because it's sort of, uh, it's the contrarian side. But, uh, um, you know, I mean, I, I, I think about the, I call, I've been calling this film like an anti-utopian film. Uh, and uh, I think that there's some that there's some sense sense to that. Uh, so many of our of our uh, uh, you know our our cinematic experiences in the in the in the consumer market and 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 uh, you know consumer narrative uh, are all just sort of aspirational and they leave us sort of like uh, I think just it's the hall of mirrors sort of thing. Mm -hmm. They leave us validated and uh, you know uh, uh, and, and anesthetized and uh, you know they, they they do everything we want them to do they and then we walk away unchanged and uh, the world and dreams even which you know cinema uh, uh, riffs off of I mean the whole experience is the the oneric darkness and the and the you know the images um, the, they, they aren't even on our terms you know and uh, I think it, 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 it we develop really uh, problematic instincts when, when then we go out into the world and we look for everything to be on our terms and to and to validate us and then I think it produces uh, all kinds of uh, problems bigotry among them so I want to talk now about the augmented reality experience that you put together that premiered at Sundance uh, you have some uh, a presentation you want to show is that right Austin yeah, so I put together just a small promo video kind of thing and then there is some behind the scene footage of us filming in volumetric without any music, so get ready to feel it. Okay, awkward. let's give it a look. <laughs> So this is some footage from one of our shoots. Um, basically, the idea is that we're capturing live actors with 106 different cameras from every angle and then reproducing images of them that then you can see in full 3D and walk around and interact with and even talk with. Um, that's kind of what the meshes of the holograms look like. And the experience revolves around you being in a child's bedroom and there is this kid who's lying on the bed who kind of welcomes you in and he's like, hey, like, I didn't see you there. Did your mom ever read you bedtime stories? Because I'm waiting for my mom to come back and read me, be me bedtime stories. This is our set right now in the New Frontier section. We have a whole kid's bedroom set up where you put on a headset that's completely transparent and through it you're able to see these holograms on the bed and interacting with the space. Um, how did the story come about? What, were the, what was the genesis of what you wrote and how what were the challenges of translating what you wrote into the experience and why was this the right medium for that story? So um, I, I usually start with the medium. Um, for me, what's most important is to ex keep experimenting with this new medium and the kind of opportunities that it's presenting. So two of the big things that I'd like to deal with are, are is this idea of presence, um, feeling like someone's actually there and building an association with an image. And the second is this idea of context. So I actually don't work in virtual reality. I only work with augmented reality because that distinction really matters to me. How would you explain the distinction for people who don't understand? So virtual reality is when you put on a headset that completely takes you out of your space. It completely blocks your vision. Versus augmented reality is when you're actually still in your space and you have holograms augmented or added onto that space. Um, and that, that really makes a huge difference. So for example, my last piece was called Terminal 3. and it was this airport terminal where you would go in and you would play the role of a customs officer and you would get to interrogate 
these holograms of seemingly Muslim passengers. And this was a documentary experience. So these were all real people whose stories we captured and we captured them in volumetric. And as you had this interaction with them, initially they would be very abstracted, made up of lines. And as you started asking, you know, the questions would start off being like, where are you coming from? Have you, did you ever had an interaction with the Taliban? And as you asked more and more personal questions, like, have you ever been in love? The holograms started to appear more and more realistic. And at the end of the experience, you would walk into the second room and you would have to make a decision of whether you're, not letting, you're going to let this person into the country. And in the second room, the real person in the flesh whose hologram we had made would be sitting there to kind of hear your response. Wow. Um, and so this, this piece was kind of a jumping off point from that. Terminal 3 was really specific to a place, right? Context, you have to build this terminal in order for it to work. I wanted to build something that was a specific enough context, but, but still scalable, which we could push out to people. So the bedroom kind of became that space because it's personal, it's intimate, everyone has associations with their bedroom that are unique to them. But at the same time, it has a bed and it's a flat surface and that's scalable. A lot of people have bedrooms. Um, so that was kind of one element. And the other element was this idea of um, AI that I was starting to think a lot about. Um, things like Sophia from Hanson Robotics, I don't know if you're familiar with. Um, there's a lot of AI out there right now that is presented as um, humanoid and presented as if it has agency. Um, and that really, really bothers me because the only people that get to talk about AI are people who are building this stuff. And the only people who get to understand and criticize it are the people who are building this stuff as well. So um, we wanted to build a piece that would show the absurdity of how crazy it is to personify an, um, an artificially intelligent system. Usually it's just data crunching on steroids with a layer of storytelling on top. It's the same thing that we do. They have writers and branching narratives and you know, interactivity, but there's no real intelligence, there's no real agency. But by pretending that your AI has agency, you get to give away your own responsibility as a company. Um, so in order to tell the story, I wanted to do it in a very absurdist way. So you go into the experience thinking uh, that this is some perverse bedtime story, but it's actually a reverse Turing test in which you are interrogated by an AI to see if you're human or not. And you're presented all these scenarios with a kid that's asking you questions and the mom that reads the story and everything somewhat of a metaphor to AI and personification. And you've done the experience and at some point it starts getting really crazy. So <laughs> at some point you take, the child gets up and he's like, hey, let me show you my friends. And he takes out this cage of three rats. And there's a rat outside the cage. And he's like, oh, we should reunite them because they need to play together. And this is where like your own bodily gestures and everything kind of come in. So earlier in the experience, the AI tells you to find a key in the room. And now you have this physical key that you use to open this holographic cage. And when you turn the key, the rats all come out and attack the rat that was outside and just kill it and, uh, into little shreds. And, the child is like, you know what, they don't really feel anything anyway. And after that, it just gets really absurd. And there's suddenly a rat queen who's giving a speech at the rat funeral, who's a human-sized queen, and the rats are tiny, and they're all rising up against the humans, and they decide that they have to take revenge, and either the boy or the viewer is going to have to suffer um, the consequences. And in this moment, the AI comes back and the AI says, you have to make a decision now. Either you have to terminate the child or yourself. And in this moment, there is a door in the wall that opens and inside the wall is a cage inside which sits the real boy. Not a hologram, but oh. a real actor playing the real boy. And everybody, including me, probably takes off their goggles and it is a real person. Oh. And it really forces the spectator I mean, this is kind of getting to what we're talking about. This is not about understanding the characters you're looking at. It's understanding about what you see in yourself by looking at what characters are doing in both nonfiction and fictional film. How do you see people reacting to this choice? It's basically a trolley, trolley dilemma where you have to decide, am I take my own life or take this child's it's life? It's interesting because for me, the dichotomy of like what was at stakes here was like this human versus AI element, right? Like, this moment was supposed to be a paradox where if you say, kill me, you let an AI manipulate you by showing you images that are gonna get you to that point. Literally, people are in there screaming like, terminate me because it's a voice activated experience. And if you terminate the child, like the child is there in front of you. He's like staring into your eyes in the flesh. 
Um, that was kind of the, what I was going after. But turns out the human versus AI thing is, you know, it's, it's another topic. The main topic is human versus human. Because I literally, 80% of women roughly say kill me, and 80% of men say kill the child. And on top of it, if you go By the way, I just want to say, I said kill me, not the child. <laughs> 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 and what's even more bizarre is I've had people come out and be like, if the child was a girl, I wouldn't have killed him. <laughs> and on top of it, I've had someone come out and be like, if the child was a different race, I may not have killed him. It's a bit familiar, familiar with the would you kill baby Hitler dilemma? I heard of it. Oh, yeah, the, it wa the, it was a, the idea. It was a popular question in, on Twitter, if you could travel back in time yeah, yeah. And, 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 and you saw baby Hitler, would you, would you kill baby Hitler? <laughs> Maybe that's your next installation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hitler comes back to life in a cage in the wall. Yeah. <laughs> you are all talking about pushing boundaries, and that's the nature of our panel. And there are forms and formulas that most filmmakers and augmented reality and VR people conformed to. So when you are trying to get backers, when you're trying to get people who believe in your vision, who support you, and they're used to a certain way of storytelling and certain ways that those stories are gonna to be told and resolved, what is the conversation that you have to have with people to come on board to believe in a different way of telling a story? Because none of you would be here if you didn't have somebody who believed in you, could be a financier, could be an actor, could be somebody, could be the festival. How do you get them on board with your vision when your vision flies in the face of the way that things are typically done? I mean, it's, it's just hard, I guess. <laughs> I mean, there's always a point where I think, you know, boy, it would be so much easier to do this if I was just making the same movie over and over again, which is what I feel like most of my peers are doing, and it's so obviously easier, um, but it, <laughs> it also seems really boring. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think that with my pr all four of my features, like, I've had to um, push them really far independently before anyone had any interest in being part of them. Um, so with Hail Satan, you know, we were developing it for a year and a half, just kind of scrapping, you know, money together to do shoots and just, you know, really building up this sample. And we had to sort of build up the sample, I think, really a lot more than a lot of people do to get funding together. But I mean, you know, again, it was like a movie about Satanism. We were starting from a very strange position, and we had to sort of prove a lot more than I think maybe someone else might have. But when you've made a movie, as you have, called Nuts, about the medicinal uh, powers of goat testicles, mm -hmm. does that actually benefit you no. that you could, no. No, no. Nuts does I not help I at honestly, all. Honestly, like, I think I had this misconception when I was younger that at a certain point, like, if I made enough successful, critically acclaimed, financially remunerative films, that somehow the next pitch meeting, mm. they'd just be like, here's your blank check. I don't think that happens. It's, it doesn't happen for me. Um, certainly, like, I feel like I'm really starting over every time. And how do you make sure that in getting those people on board, you I'm don't... I'm curious if you guys yeah. have that experience or not. I mean... How do you not compromise? How do you not say, okay, I get what you want and we'll add this? How do you make sure that you are making the movie that you want to make yeah. if people are telling you, I want it a little bit different? Well, I mean, my secret is that I'm a tenured college professor, you know? Like, I don't need my movies to be successful. That's the answer. I don't. Like, I've had a lot of success, and that's great, but it was never the case that my mortgage payment depended on my films. It just isn't. So that's my actual answer. I'm not sure how anyone else does it, but that's how I do it. Mads, what about you? What's your approach when you're trying to get people on board? Well, actually, with um, Cold Case Hammerschild, it, it, it's, it, it's supported by the Danish, Swedish, and Norwegian Film Institute. But Pitching it to the Swedish film consultant was the, the ultimate pitch of, of my life. What was it like? Because I'm sitting there explaining about the commercial, and then suddenly uh, she begins crying, the film consultant. And uh, Sweden is much more politically correct than Denmark, and um, so I said, I'm, I'm sorry, did I say something in inappropriate? And then she <laughs> said, no, I think it's, it's, so, it's, it's so wonderful that you, a Danish man, wants to make a film about the Lord of Peace, as they call Hammarskjöld in, uh, in Sweden. And there I knew that she would give me a, a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was nice. So yeah. flattery. Yes. <laughs> no, but as with uh, Penny, I'm, I'm, my daytime job is, um, 
I, I work at a national talk radio station in Denmark, mm. public service talk radio. So I'm not dependent on the the films I I do that they are like you know performing in a speci spe specific way, mm. which is you know mentally it means a lot. Yeah, it really yes, does. Yes. Like I would do a lot to protect that feeling that I could totally fail. Yes. And it's okay. Yeah, that is very nice. Rick, what about you? Oh, it's just tedious. It's the the daily. You mean you know, a lot. Most filmmakers, I think, in the independent space, spend the majority amount of their time trying to figure out how how to get movies made. You know, um, and uh, inevitably that that means compromise. But I think for me and maybe a, a lot of us here, it's uh, it's sort of like what compromises are are interesting. You know, and what compromises are a stealthy way actually to. Uh, engage with the medium, you know. Uh, I mean, I, I had always, my, my early ambition was always to work with non-actors. Um, and, uh, you know, Jeff Goldblum was in this last film, and people, you know, people that have personas out into the public space, is, I mean, it's very, you know, it's, it's, they're, they're not non-actors, they're very professional. Um, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's fascinating to me because you can come at that and uh, you know, at, at another angle, an angle that just isn't promotional for your film and just isn't promotional for the actor. And, and uh, you know, you find like-minded people and, uh, and financiers uh, included, you know, Vice did this one with us and they were really willing to take some risks and, and could, you know, and uh, so. Yeah. And the benefit of non-professional actors is what, hypothetically? Hmm. Uh, well, uh, benefit, I mean, I just, uh, you know, I was always sort of, I mean, it, it it gets right to the to the root of something, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're essentially recontextualizing. Uh, I I always found it in my early movies, you know, which were very quiet, small films, uh, that that it was a very efficient way to arrive at at, at, a, at a at a kind of naturalism, you know. But then on the other side of it, so so were so were uh, highly trained professional actors in a, in a more cinematic space. But I started to become interested in the artificial, you know. So, uh, you know. Also, what about you? How do you go about getting people to understand an idea like this when it's not like you can even show them a script or like, you know, presentation reel? How do you sell it and how do you get people to, to marry uh, into your idea? I think um, for me that building up a repertoire of projects that are out there and like get press or get interest or, you know, become interesting on some cultural level has been really helpful. Um, so initially my projects were like me sitting in a dorm room, like pushing something out on my own and trying to get some press without even really exhibiting anywhere. Um, but with Terminal 3, we raised some money on Kickstarter and you know, it was, uh, the project was for a community. There were people that were really interested in the topic itself. And then there was another community that's interested in the technology itself. And we were able to get past a certain level and then we were able, when, then we got into Tribeca last year and we were able to, at that point, bring in some producers for finishing funds. Um, and then after working with this company called Riot that provided us finishing funds for that project, um, we realized that since the project was out there and was successful in the sense that it was well received, um, they were able to offer us more financial support for a new project and I didn't really even have to go out and ask for money, which was just great. Um, and, but the tricky part, but th there were a lot more challenges with this project, of course, when I called Shari, the programmer, and I was like, okay, we're gonna get three kids that are doppelgangers, we're gonna put them in a cage. <laughs> um, and then, you know, my producers had a lot of time researching child labor laws in Utah. Um, <laughs> Which are what? I'm curious. <laughs> are they like the liquor laws or worse? <laughs> um, so if you put a child in a cage for four hours at a time, you're good. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> as long as they're not drinking. <laughs> important, important. As long as their mom is opening the cage, that's, that's also a plus. <laughs> right, right. Um, but what I would say is that the challenging part with this new medium, of course, is distribution, right? Like right. There's no platform, there's no buyer out here that's looking to buy this piece. Um, I love that. I, that's like part of the work for me. Like half the work is making the piece, half of the artistic process is actually figuring out distribution for yourself. And I think that's like what's so exciting about new media work where you're not relying on a platform, you're not, you, you don't, you're not limited to like a two hour film that has to fit in certain standards. You can just really do whatever, you can put a real actor in there, you could 
you know, build a set, you could do whatever you want, but then the question is, how do you distribute this while keeping in the artistic integrity of the piece in mind? And I'm really excited to see how that process unfolds for this piece. I designed it ground up to actually get to people's bedrooms, you know, and I have a strategy of how that would happen, but I'm excited to like take that next creative leap now. I have reserved some time for audience questions. I have one last question for the panelists, so I'll get to your audience questions in just a second. There are thousands of projects, and if you count short films, more than 10,000 projects that try to come to Sundance. And it's hard enough to get what it is you want to make made. And then you have to get into the festival, and then you are seen here. There are things that you can take away from a festival, reviews, a distribution deal, maybe a prize on Saturday. But as storytellers, what are the rewards that you look for? Is it an overheard conversation in the lobby? Is it somebody having a conversation with you? What are the most, what are the most pleasing things for you as artists to know that your work has connected in the way that you intended? Yeah, actually, I'm really glad you asked that because just this morning I was thinking in my, during my morning coffee, like, I want to make sure I'm thinking of this week as like, the the thing like not a means to an end mm -hmm. but like this is the like this is why I do this you know like the audiences here are so amazing you know we've had screenings in Salt Lake City with like a lot of Mormons and ex Mormons and like you know the, the the topics in the film are really important and people are having such a good time watching the film and they're and they're coming up to me and grabbing my arm and saying I think I might be a Satanist my mom's gonna kill me <laughs> you know and like. I don't know what more you can ask for. I mean, like, if nothing else came of this, like, this would be such a reward, you know, just to be able to show the film with, for people. Like, that's really all we're trying to do is, like, communicate with people. And also, I would just say, you don't have to get into Sundance, just to be clear, you know? Okay. <laughs> you know, there's so many different ways to do it, and um, most people won't get into Sundance, and they'll still find an audience, you know? And the audiences are what it's all about for me. It sounds so cliche. But I was trying to remember that this morning, mm -hmm. that it's not just about, like, oh, am I going to get the pull quotes that I need for the poster, or, and, like, mm. you know, like, this is it. Like, this is why we do this. I want to celebrate that. Matt, what about you? I think the most um, intense moment was right after the second screening, in the, in the audience was a, um, a NBA player from Antonio Spurs, a, a giant of a man, of course, that goes without saying. <laughs> um, he's a, he's a, a black guy from France originally. So he walks up to me and says, I need to see you. And I thought, if, he, if he's not liking the film, I'm in dire straits. <laughs> yes, I was saying, no. Um, but, but then he was, uh, he was extremely excited about the film. And um, yeah, it was just, you know, an intense moment. So is it people who don't know the story who are intrigued by it? Is it people who have changed their way of thinking of a part of history? Well, um, I, my, my ambition was the film to be like a, as much as a novel as possible. So you will keep on thinking about the structure or the, the findings for, for hopefully like days, weeks or after. Uh, and it, it appears as if, you know, I, I do meet people here who are, you know, making new discoveries in the film. Mm -hmm. Rick, what about you? Uh, well, I live in Richmond, Virginia, so, like, there's, it's, it's nice, to, nice to come here, be around other, other people that are struggling in the business for however many reasons, and also to talk to audiences. I mean, like... I've never understood sort of just the making films for yourself thing. I mean, people watch them, they imbibe them. There seems to be a certain amount of responsibility and uh, I don't know, I, I'm, I increasingly think about the audience's perspective all the, t all the time. So to hear from them about their experience is huge to me and really you know, can be relieving because all of us are very sensitive about what we do. Sometimes people think that we don't, you know, we're impenetrable and don't give a shit, you, you know, but like, <laughs> it does matter what people think. And it isn't just the rewarding sort of like accolades, you know. It's sort of, did this affect you? Does this have meaning? Am I, am I wasting my life? <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. So, Asif, what about you? I really wish I had a more romantic answer, but as long as the piece works. <laughs> um, I, I have a live stream of the installation on my phone, and I'm always just looking. I'm like, okay. He's opening the rat cage. He's opening. Oh, I hope it Wait, doesn't crash. Wait, are you watching <laughs> us? Yeah. Oh my oh. goodness. We should have had oh. that going. You know, the whole I, time. there's probably a job opening for you at Facebook. <laughs> you're spying on us. 
So you are watching so every spectator watch the, interesting. So that's what I go to sleep with, basically. <laughs> um, but what the, do you want to see? What, what gratifies you in terms of how people are, are experiencing? I think, I think what's most gratifying is honestly the parts you didn't expect. Um, I mean, just for it to work is really quite rewarding because we were really working till the last day and we'd, we've not had time to play test. And a lot of it is hypothetical. It's like, okay, if this is the AI and then it's this and this will happen, it should work. Um, you don't really have the time and capacity to like get the rhythm right and those kind of things. So since people are having the experience and coming out with um, you know, the kind of emotions we were trying to get out of them, it, that's, that's already rewarding enough. But as I said, that for example, that thing we were just talking about, about how I was surprised at how who would say what would actually be so like categorical in a way. Um, and same when with, with, with Terminal 3, when it was out there, like uh, weird things like when a Muslim interrogates another Muslim, the experience they have is just so much different than another person who, let's say, lives in mm -hmm. the US already. So, we'll, the, and they came out with a very different kind of um, appreciation for immigration officers. That was, was never the intention. Um, but like those kind of surprising elements are usually very rewarding. We have time for audience questions. It's going to be a little bit random in terms of who I pick. We have microphones, so wait till they get to you. And I say this at every Q&A, no speeches, no pitches. Imagine we're at a dinner party, and this is a question that you would ask at a dinner party. <laughs> um, so I'll start with you in the front, wait for the mic to come to you since we are recording this. And the more concise the questions, the more we can get to. Okay, I'll try to but You're, you're going to be our, you're going to set the standard. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. Um, so I feel inevitably every film follows a structure and somehow it falls into the three act structure. So when you're writing a film, do you uh, consciously try to avoid that or do you embrace it and try to get rid of like all the stereotypical cliches like, oh, this is the inciting incident, that there has to be a resolution? I'm going to ask Rick this because you're the most narrative of all the films up here, the uh, whole three act structure idea. Pre uh, my previous two films were uh, uh, very much not three act in so, in so far as they were totally episodic. And they, they, they went through these sort of uh, circular kind of like narrative variations, you know, and, and, and increased. And in, I was interested in how the, how the audience experience accrued over that, how it changed with the changes, you know, in this circular sort of thing. I like that a lot, but uh, this one, uh, it's, uh, I, I wanted to, to play with those conventions a little more. So there are exactly three acts. There are three of these sort of, there's a, f a father and two father figures. They're sort of, they're very delineated. It's separated in mind, body, and spirit. And it's, it's like, it just goes on and on and on. Uh, so, I mean, there, it's very, I mean, it's very interesting to play with uh, the way that our default sort of relationships to, to that sort of thing. I mean, it can get, uh, you know, it, in, a, in a conventional sense to me, it's, it, it sort of can be very boring to see films that, that sort of satisfy all of those things. I like when, they, I like the failures in, in film. I always have, you know. I mean, I, a lot of people celebrate John Cassavetes, you know, and I see, I, I see like all of these glorious failures that he let happen and the thing started to come apart and, you know, and uh, some, some, some folks act like that was intentional, but... Uh, you know, he, I don't know, I, it's, it's beautiful when things feel volatile, you know, and then I suppose there's room for that in the three-act structure, but it needs to really, need to punch some holes in it. <laughs> okay, next question, I'm going to go, I'm going to do, this is going to be so unfair, but uh, is there, <laughs> way back on the aisle, again, if you keep them short, we'll get to a lot of yours. Yeah, keep going, keep going, right there, there you go. Hi, um, I got a question about uh, the production process because it's usually super long, even if you have a uh, European uh, Institute support. And I know that uh, filmmakers are curious about the world, curious about the th uh, everything and ideas change and how you stay dedicated to this one project that you've been developing for so long. Thank you so much. Um, I'll just speak, if you don't mind. I mean, I'll you know, I think that that's like, if, if you're a film director, like that's the one thing you are really good at. And I can't say why I'm good at that, except that I look around and I see that a lot of people don't have that kind of stick to itness because most of the time you're getting no, fuck you, go away, no, <laughs> like, you know, so I don't know. Like, I, I don't know how, how do you stay interested in your projects 
I don't, I, maybe that's my only skill. I'm very good at it, I guess. And Mats, you were working on this film for how long? Uh, about seven years. Seven years. At the end, it was like living on top of a mountain of research. Mm -hmm. And I was longing for a Marie Kondo kind of person that would come and declutter all <laughs> this, this enormous mountain of research. <laughs> but uh, no, it, it, it has to, you have to be uh, obsessive. Clearly, you have to be obsessive. And also, I think that is the Protestant side to me. Uh, maybe I should go for Satanism instead. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it's the Protestant side of me who, I, you know, it's important for me to finish off. Right. But also because it, had, it became, you know, in the end, a, a running joke in Copenhagen to ask me how my Da Kammerschul film was doing. <laughs> you, know, you know, the film that you will never finish. But what you also <laughs> did is you incorporated the process into the story. That the, the fact that it took so long to find yes. the answers, the fact that you're out in the shovel with your two little shovels trying to dig up a mountain of evidence becomes part of the, part of the film itself. Yes, very much so. Okay, uh, let's go way, way back. Um, here, you with a backward baseball hat. <laughs> Hang on a sec for the mic. You guys are doing great. I love the very <laughs> concise questions. Go. Can you tell us a time when you had a boundary pushing concept that did not succeed? Great question. Yeah. Who wants to answer that? Um, I was for a, a long time working on a film about uh, Radu Van Kartic, um, who was um, the uh, spiritual architect behind the um, Serbian uh, war crimes in, in uh, Yugoslavia. Um, and he was like a, in a way, a, like a, a Christian Osama bin Laden. He was, he was in the hiding for a great many years in the area of, uh, you know, ex-Yugoslavia. My idea was to basically uh, f find him and kidnap him. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so, um, so I, I, for, I, I spent a long time <laughs> flying to Belgrade to befriend the inner circle of Kadic, uh, hanging out with these very unsavory, crazy guys. Were you posing as a journalist? Yeah, I was. Okay. Uh, but as a journalist with really weird political point of views. Okay. Um, and I, I, I really, you know, became friends with, you know, amongst them a Serbian senator named Brana, who's probably the most evil person I've ever met. He had this disease where there was like small horns growing out of his eyes. It looked like something from, like the, the emperor in, in Star Wars or something. He told me that if Hamlet had been a Serbian, he would have killed everyone in the castle, which left a, uh, an impression in me. No, but at the end of all of this, um, I, we pretty much knew where Karadzic was hiding. We knew the, the area of Belgrade where he was. So we were ready to get going. And, 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 and all the financing was there. We've been working on it for five, five years. The financing for the movie or for the kidnapping? For, for the financing for the movie and the kidnapping. Okay. <laughs> e everything was there. Look. And people told us, you know, he, would, he will never get caught. You know. But then, I think two weeks before we are to start shooting the film, they capture him. So I'm suddenly in this very <laughs> weird situation that, that I'm angry about, <laughs> you know, out of capture of a war criminal. Yes, be, being brought <laughs> to the Hague, and um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I have to say I don't think anybody can top I that. Yeah, okay. Sure. <laughs> uh, right here, right here in front. We'll try to get to like six more. So if I don't get to everybody, I'm sorry, but I think the panelists can stick around for a couple of minutes afterwards. So go ahead. So Matt, one of my most memorable moments at Sundance was when you screened The Ambassador. Thank and, you. And at The Prospector, and the old man got up and said you had to be arrested on the spot yeah. because uh, you, you were doing illegal trafficking of diamonds plus all these people that had died uh, in, the pro in the journey of, of you documenting this, this trade. And you looked, you looked rather, uh, I mean, you know, the, the characters in the movie yes, that, yes, yes. That, 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 that the head of state security yes. yes and so you looked very concerned when this old man was calling for your arrest and i was wondering if 
if if you brought him along with you, or if this was no. this no. really happened. <laughs> I, I think it was the very well, explain, first question. Explain what the ambassador is about, so people. It's it's about how I, I purchase a diplomatic title and become the general consul of Liberia to the Central African Republic. And um, it's kind of like playing a clown in a psychiatric ward. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Actually, yes. Um, but it, 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 at, at that screening, it was, I think it was the very first question. Yes. Yes. You're very angry. Yes. And I, you know. You look very angry. Yes. I thought if, if all the questions would be like this, I will <laughs> have a difficult time doing Q&As. <laughs> but not an actor, a real person. No, but, yeah. But, but the, the most interesting Q&A actually was in when the film came to Moscow. And at that point in time, I was kind of fed up with Q&As about mo morals and ethics and <laughs> and then, but to my amazement and utter joy, the, the Russians were seeing the film as a positive tale about a young businessman who is out to make some money. <laughs> uh, and all the, qu the questions were my, very much in the line of, I also want to buy diamonds. Can you give me the number for Monsieur wow. Chibert? And yeah, that was fun. <laughs> Um, a question back toward this area. Okay, right there, yes, I see your hand. On the, uh, one in from the aisle up here. There you go. Hey there, Penny. Um, the three of us are faculty members at a university in Texas, and I would like to know how do you transit, um, how does your filmmaking transfer to your students, and what do you do to inspire their boundary pushing? That's oh, a great yeah. question. Well, I have a very, I'm gonna give you an extremely specific like pedagogical answer, because I like to be specific. So I have to give my students grades, and it's terrible, because nobody should be grading art. I mean, it's just so immoral, but this is the world I live in. And so one of the things I do is I drop the lowest grade. Of, so, so like if you have five projects, like I'll, I'll say like whatever one you get the lowest grade on, I can drop that from your final grade. Sorry for those of you, this is like really inside baseball. But that really encourages, what I'm trying to do is encourage people to take risks because people are really scared that they're not gonna get an A. You know, so I want them to like do something that really has the potential to fail or like suck. And so I find that if you take a little bit of the mm -hmm. grade pressure off, it actually really, really helps. I'm gonna ask all of you here, mm -hmm. just show of hands, did you learn more from failure than success? Learn more from failure, show of hands. Yeah, of course. I mean, that's like, I mean. Learn more from success? Okay. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know. Okay, so it's a yeah, it's, it's a long conversation about those things. Uh, let's go right here with the glasses. Am I mixing it up? Age, gender? Am I doing okay? <laughs> I'm trying. Go, uh, Rick. You spoke about um, different ways that people uh, to leave the audience um, maybe not so satisfied, and I was wondering, other than subverting structure, uh, what uh, what are some of the things you, you use in order to leave them feeling? maybe, uh, they call it their friendom's effect, like alienated? Right, I mean the withholding and mm -hmm. sort of excess, like the inaccessibility of certain characters, the, 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 you know, preventing them from forgetting about the formal components of the film and just entering into it, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, creating obstructions so that doesn't happen, so they're, they're sort of like, they desire to get in, they, they wanna know what a character's thinking, but I don't let them know. Uh, I think, you know, my hope is that that creates a sort of constructive restlessness and, a, and uh, you know, an active kind of uh, event in the viewer as opposed to the narcotized, anesthetic kind of passive event that when you just get everything you want and you're just, uh, <laughs> you know, and you're just, you just flatline, you know. Um, I love the idea that there's certain things you can, you can certain trouble you can make that, that, that uh, engineers critical thinking, you know, so. Um, I want a, uh, who has a augmented reality gestures tail question? There you go, you get the next question. I wanna make sure everybody's represented. Do you see his hand, he's up here? It's okay, films are for old people anyway, I'm not this one. Wait, wait for the mic, wait for the mic. <laughs> uh, so you had mentioned 80% of men were saying this and 80% of women were not killing them. And then you, then you describe live streaming. So I'm just wondering, so you're, you're getting, you're, is your AI integrated into this and you're really like almost instantaneous Nielsen type of <laughs> what is this embodying and where are you gonna take that mm. in furthering augmented reality and audience reactions real time to your stuff and you know, and, and really putting this into a database or measuring it so that you can make alterations to this. 
I mean, like, it's interesting because when I try to make work, I don't try to look at it just only as a piece of content, but something that is, like, this is a reverse Turing test in that sense. Um, the, the problem is that while setting it up at Sundance, first of all, you don't have enough scale, right? Like, it's a 20-minute piece, one person at a time sees it, you get the sample size of a few hundred people, and that's not really enough to, you know, say anything meaningful or really use it as, uh, put it in a database or something. Um, when I say 80%, it's more of like what I see happening, more or less, uh, how people are going, reacting, coming out. It's very, very arbitrary. Um, but that's where scale becomes interesting. So when we do end up publishing this, let's say, on an app store where people can experience this in one form or the other on their iPhones, um, maybe capturing that kind of data becomes very interesting. Um, and I mean, like I started thinking yesterday, we were talking to one of my producers, and can we iterate and like have, let's say, the boy be a different race depending on who it is, or uh, be a different gender, or play with those kind of elements and see what kind of responses we get and what kind of data emerges from that. Um, because as I said earlier, like this initially it was like, okay, how does it the dichotomy of like a, a machine that's an agent or is presented as an agent compared to a human? Like that was the question. But yeah, where even the human to human question is not answered yet. There are so many we we empathize with people on this based on so many different factors. Um, so at that point, I would definitely be interested in seeing what that kind of data can lead to. Does it terrify you that, that the corporate and the potential of, of being able to get that kind of behavioral data in people's bedrooms, you know, that those relationships? I mean, it's like the gold mine, right? I mean, it's, it's interesting that like, that's, that's kind of what we're trying to also criticize sure. in a way. Yeah. Um, and sure, like, I mean, I think it will come with a lot of different elements of, you know, permission and, you know, what happens with the data and all that, those kind of elements. Because, I mean, my, my view on data in general is that I think there, there are totally ways to ethically gather it and there are totally mm -hmm. ways to ethically use it. I mean, researchers and um, this, that's the scientific method. That's how this world works and has yeah. been going on for hundreds of years. Um, of course, when you start using that for advertisement and changing people's behaviors and presenting AI as having agency and whatnot, then it becomes problematic. But that, I don't think that means that um, just because a phone can capture data that is like inherently unethical and should not be um, experimented with at all. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna take one more question, that way we'll have a couple minutes for you to come up and say hi to the panelists if you don't get your question asked. So who is like really, right here, yes. Hang on a sec, the mic's coming your way. And I apologize to people who didn't get to ask, but come on up afterwards. Um, so my question is, since you guys are boundary pushing filmmakers, is there a, a touchstone film, a touchstone boundary pushing film that you guys have seen that you constantly go back and watch and there's something new to unpack? Right. Great. Or, or something that made you who you are in terms of an artist. Yeah. Any? Sure. Uh, yeah, Exit Through the Gift Shop was very formative <laughs> for me. Uh, I had just never seen anything that was so smart and so fun and it just really, it, it proved that something was possible that I had, was trying to do in my head. And I, I watch that film all the time. Matt? I think it's, um, it, it's an it, Italian documentary called in, in Sucrestenia Goes to Palermo. Um, about a mafia guy who is in jail in his own apartment in Palermo and then he arranges the Sicilian Oscars where he hands out Oscars <laughs> to guys who play mafia guys in movies. <laughs> Killing me. Um, <laughs> but what is so, so funny about, what I really like about the film is the way the, um, the director interviews in Castagna. he's very happy about himself. He sits <laughs> in a big, you know, in a like Sergio Trecini tracksuit then the director says, Enzo Castagna. And he says, yes. Is it correct that you are the most important man in Italian cinema? And he says, ah, <laughs> no. And, but it, and then he uh, convinces Enzo Castagna that he in fact is. So <laughs> they start all over. Is it correct you are the most uh, important man in Italian cinema? And he says, yes. Mm. In the end, he makes him say that he is the most important uh, cinematic person in the universe. <laughs> it's, it's really funny. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Uh, two of my favorite films are uh, uh, Idiots by Lars von Trier and It's a Wonderful Life, but they have to be watched together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like simultaneously? Well that, well, that would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> side by Double side. Double feature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. 
Uh, I really like Pink Floyd's The Wall. <laughs> 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 I'm wearing my nerdy Pink Floyd socks today. Um, yeah, it's just oh. the Dark Side of the Moon uh, album cover. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm, I, I'd say I'm biased. I grew up listening to a lot of Pink Floyd. My dad was a huge fan. Um, but I think there is something about that film and there's something about music in general being very visceral and not as linear as you would expect it to be. Like, I look at it, it's kind of a really extended music video. And that's kind of how I want to approach VRAR storytelling as well. Before I thank the panel, I want to thank you guys for showing up. But I want to say, you know their names. You've got to remember their projects. Hail Satan, with a question mark. <laughs> Cold Case Hammerskold, The Mountain, and A Jester's Tale. If you haven't seen them, try to see them. Come up and say hi. Thank you so much for coming out. And thank you, panelists. <laughs>